We have learned in our study of processes that there are specific files that launch a process. So here is Process Explorer running. I'm going to slide down here and pick something. Um, this is Trestor. This is a offline storage, much like Dropbox. And you can see Trestor.exe is the file that launches the process. If I right mouse click and go to properties, we know that threads are going to be running in it. And we can look at different features of it. We can look at the actual Trestor.exe file. That is the file that actually runs the process. We also see the command line, how it was executed. We can see the Trestor.exe uh, forward slash tray was the switch that was used. And we can learn a lot about what the file is that launched the process. We also know the process ID and things of that nature. But we must learn a lot more than just this. We also know that inside the Trestor.exe process is many threads. We see a number of thread IDs, so we can scroll down here. We've chosen the thread tab. We see some starting and some stopping. So there are threads running in the process. And if you'll notice carefully, we see a lot of DLLs here. These are the DLLs responsible for the different threads in the process. So in this lesson, we're going to stay focused on DLLs. What are the roles inside the process? What are their roles in creating threads inside the process? If we don't understand DLLs, we probably will not understand processes very well. To begin with, we're going to look at two basic categories of DLLs. We're going to notice I'm in the C drive. I'm looking at program files. This would be 64 bit programs. And then we have program files x86. These would be 32 bit programs. Let's open up some 32 bit programs and let's look at Adobe. Open this up. And this is Adobe Reader 11.0. And I'm going to open up the folder called Reader. And if you'll notice, there is the, uh, the actual executable that launches the Adobe Reader process. And if you'll notice in this folder are lots of DLLs. We can see that there's just a long list of DLLs. These are the, uh, we know that the executable is going to open up the process, set up security, require memory, and then it's going to begin to call up these DLLs that are going to run threads, provide resources, data, etc. So the first category of DLLs that I want to talk about are the DLLs developed by the application developer. In this case, Adobe. When Adobe wrote the software, Adobe Reader, they developed the file that launches the process, as well as many, many, many DLLs that work inside the process Adobe Reader. So there are the first category of DLLs are the DLLs that are written by the developer. And we can see that if I go back to the program files, let's say I go to Evernote and I open up the Evernote folder, I can see the Evernote.exe and that is probably the file that launches the process Evernote. But you can see there are many DLLs that are going to be called up into the process and run. They're going to run threads. They're going to run. They're going to have data. They're going to have resources for the Evernote software program. So there are two basic categories of DLLs. One, DLLs that are written by the software developer. And those are generally found under program files. Here is Google Chrome. I'm going to open that up. And we can see that Chrome.exe is the file that launches the Chrome browser. As we open up subsequent directories in that directory, we see all kinds of DLLs that were written by Google for their Chrome browser. So the first category of DLLs are going to be DLLs that are typically found and written by the program developer. And they're usually found under program files. Now, here's the dirty little secret. Occasionally, and this is, this is something that program application developers often do, is when you install their application, they will put their DLLs where they should, which would be in program files. But every once in a while, they'll throw a DLL into the System32 directory. This is something that Microsoft frowns on, but they do it anyway. 
All right, so let's take a look at the other type of DLLs. These are the Windows Operating System DLLs available for developers. So when you write a software package for Microsoft's operating system, Microsoft provides this wealth of DLLs that these applications can use and apply as their software program needs. For example, what if they need to print? A software developer what doesn't want to write all the code to print in a Windows operating system? They don't have to. Microsoft provides them libraries of DLLs and resources and data files. So all they have to do is call up the Windows DLLs and they can print their document, print whatever. They also provide graphical user interface uh, modules. They provide them copy and paste, the clipboard, and fonts, and so many other things. And obviously, the operating system itself is made available to the application for their use. So another important location is the Windows System 32. And as we scroll down this folder, you'll see gazillion DLLs. These DLLs are used by any application running in Windows. So you'll see a ton of DLLs, and these are used by any developer who writes an application for Windows can call and use these DLLs. So let's, let's go back. Two major categories of DLLs. One, DLLs written by the developer. Two, a huge library of Windows DLLs that Windows provides for any software package running in it. So back to Internet, Ex I mean, Process Explorer. Here's Trestor. If we come up to this toolbar on Process Explorer, you'll see it says Show Lower Pane. I'm going to click on that. And then I'm coming up to View. And I'm, I, you can see the Show Lower Pane is checked. I'm going to, we are going to make the Lower Pane reveal DLLs in that process. So here we can see under Trestor, uh, that's the processor that I've process that I've selected. Notice as we have revealed the lower pane and we ask it to show us all the DLLs that are being used by Trestor. You notice that a lot of them are in the Windows directory. These are the Windows library DLLs. All of these DLLs that are being used are Windows DLLs. We can scroll down and probably find one or two that are actually being written or, or have been written by the application developer. So here I've selected a DLL and you can see it's under Users, Lowell, App Data, Local. This is in my profile under Trestor version 0.8. And you can see there's a DLL and this is primarily written by the application developer. But if you'll notice, most of these DLLs are Windows DLLs. So the application developer did not write a lot of software. Most of it is really using the Windows operating system to run this cloud-based service. Another interesting note that we'll jump into, see the system WOW 64? Microsoft allows 32-bit applications to run in their 64-bit operating system. And they run under what's called WOW 64. So in this folder, SysWOW64, are a lot of DLLs that 32-bit applications want to see and need to see in order to run. Microsoft creates like a virtual environment so that it can run 32-bit apps in a 64-bit operating system. So this particular developer has pulled from Windows a rich array of DLLs in order to run Trestor, the process Trestor. So here's an example of Camtasia Studio, which I'm using to record this, this lecture. You can see camtasiastudio.exe is the file that launches the process, showing the lower pane and requesting that DLLs be uh, displayed. Let me come up here and make sure that we're showing DLLs. You can see that a lot of the DLLs that are being run are not exactly DLL uh, extensions, but they're DAT and it shows you the files that this particular process is using. We can see a lot of DLLs that are coming from the program files, x86, TechSmith. So these are DLLs being used and created by the application developer. So we see that here, we see that here and here. 
but this one is being actually being pulled from the Windows operating system. So these are Windows DLLs. Down below you can see there are many DLLs being pulled by the application developer and then we'll all of a sudden switch to Windows DLLs. So two types of two types of DLLs fundamentally. Those developed by the application developer and then those developed by Windows for any application that wants to run. Let's take a look at camstudio.exe. We're going to go into properties. DLLs make the primary code that is running threads in the process. So why it's so important that we understand DLLs is because they're really the executables running in. You can look at the threads tab and you can see that most of them are going to be DLLs. So let's first begin with Wikipedia's take on what is a DLL. First of all, they're called dynamic link library. In the Windows environment, they're an implementation of a shared library concept. In other words, code that could be shared with many applications. It was also developed in the OS2 operating systems, but we're not talking about that. We're focused on Windows. These modules of software, or these files, have extensions of DLL, OCX, also DRV. Now that's not the entire list of extensions that can represent DLLs, but that's a big one. The file formats for DLL are the same as Windows EXE files. So think of most DLLs as executables. Now one of the differences is you can't from the command line double click or execute a DLL. DLLs are executed within the process. DLLs are executables in many cases, but they're not executable within, except within the process. As with EXEs, DLLs can contain code, data, and resources in any combination. There are certain data files with the same format as a DLL, and they are called resource DLLs. For example, fonts, icons, may have an extension of FON or FOT, and they provide the resources that the process needs. So why, do we, why does Windows use DLLs? One, it uses fewer resources. When multiple programs use the same library of functions, a DLL can reduce the duplication of code that is loaded into physical memory. In other words, more than one program can use the same DLL. DLLs promote the developing of modular programs. DLLs ease deployment and installation. When a function within a DLL needs an update or a fix, the deployment and installation of the DLL does not require the program to be relinked with the DLL. So if I need to update a DLL, I can just update one file. In the early days of Microsoft's operating systems, as they were implementing this totally new concept of software development and operating systems, there were DLL dependencies. When a program or DLL uses a DLL function in another DLL, a dependency is created. In other words, they're linked together. One is dependent on the other. Therefore, the program is no longer self-contained, and the program may experience problems if that dependency is broken. For example, a program may not run if one of the following actions occur. A dependent DLL is upgraded to a new version. A dependent DLL is fixed. A dependent DLL is overwritten with an earlier version. A dependent DLL is removed from the computer. These actions are generally known as DLL conflicts. This plagued Windows 95, Windows 98, and many of the older operating systems that Microsoft developed. To combat this DLL issue, and this was a huge problem in the early operating systems of Microsoft, Microsoft incorporated f Windows File Protection. In the Windows File Protection, the operating system prevents system DLLs from being updated, deleted by an unauthorized agent. So a lot of the DLL problems started going away with Windows File Protection. Another element was private DLLs. It allows you to isolate a program from changes that are made to a shared DLL. So how do I troubleshoot DLL problems within a process? Well, one, you can use Process Explorer, Process Monitor. Uh, another handy tool is called Dependency Walker. There's the website. You can go and download a variety of versions. Dependency Walker can look at all the DLLs pulled by a process. 
It can check for missing DLLs. It can check for program files or DLLs that are not valid. It checks the import function and export function match. And dependency walk walker checks for circular dependency errors. So I've downloaded dependency walker. I'm going to double click it, open it up. Doesn't look too exciting here. We're going to open up the way that dependency walker is, is we're going to browse in the program files and find a file that launches the process. Remember the process is the one that pulls DLLs into the process, starts threads, uh, pulls up resources, etc. So I'm going to go to the open. We're going to go to program files. So you can see here I'm in the program files x86 32-bit program files folder. I'm going to open up Adobe. Here's the reader. We looked at that already. I'm going to open up the reader folder and I'm scrolling down to find the Adobe RD32 EXE. That's the actual file that opens the Adobe Acrobat Reader process and that process then pulls up DLLs. So I've chosen the file that opens the process and I say open and when we open up that file it will actually show us all the DLLs that this Adobe RD32.exe is going to call up into, into memory. And so I can see all the Windows DLLs it's going to call. I can also look at all the program developers DLLs that he's going to call. And I can use 